Osio Nigara, Jeff Ganaholito, Corntassel, Dakwadoa, Shaligie, Yetli, Gwena Sai, Echoda, Galski, Goi. So my name is Jeff Corntassel. I'm from Cherokee Nation. And uh, my Cherokee name is Ganaholito, which means hunter. And I'm also an ICCA honorary member, as well as a faculty member in Indigenous Studies at the University of Victoria. And I'm coming to you today from the unceded territories of the Kwantlen First Nation. Uh, I wanted to speak to you about life beyond the state, Indigenous expressions of sustainable self-determination. And it's really no accident that over 80% of the world's biodiversity is on Indigenous lands. Um, indigenous peoples protect these relationships as something that are sacred, but they're also life affirming. Uh, these are our territories of life as Indigenous peoples. And what happens to our territories of life also happens to our bodies. There's a strong intertwined um, uh, relationship between what happens to the land and what happens to Indigenous bodies and vice versa. And so understanding that will help us understand uh, the ravages of climate change, uh, also the encroachment of colonial entities onto our territories and onto our waters. And so I wanted to speak to you today uh, and start by challenging us all to think about how will our ancestors recognize us? How will they recognize us as Cherokee, as Kanaka Maoli, as Maori, as uh, Karen, um, as um, Mosquito? Uh, Mapuche, how will they recognize us as Indigenous? What is it that we'll do every day that is legible, is recognizable to our ancestors? And putting this forward, how will future generations recognize us? And so this talk is really all about the ways in which we protect and perpetuate our strong relationships to territories of life and to our those places that maintain our health and well-being. A key part of this is, you know, the ways that we confront colonization. Colonization is an ongoing part of our everyday lives, unfortunately. Uh, and these have intergenerational impacts, as you see in this beautiful picture by Christy Belcourt, who's Métis. Um, we also have resilience, that is, we're able to withstand uh, strong challenges to our identity, strong challenges to our ability to affect change in our communities. And so, um, we are uh, still here in that sense, uh, and we're also uh, resurging as Indigenous peoples. We're able to, uh, to reassert and reclaim and to reoccupy our territories of life in order to um, promote the future and well-being of, of Indigenous peoples. It's also important to note that when we talk about climate change, it's also a colonial problem. It's a colonial problem of, and a result of the extraction industry. It's a result of encroachment onto our territories of life. And uh, ultimately, uh, colonization needs to be challenged and confronted uh, just as we confront the realities of climate change. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the, uh, the ravaging fires uh, that occurred two years ago in Australia, killed over a billion of the animals on that continent. Um, in the lower right hand corner, you see the result of an oil spill on Haltzik First Nation, uh, which is devastating their, uh, their ability to harvest. And this is a, a sign that I saw at a, at a food um, exhibit in Los Angeles. And it said, we will need 70% more food by 2050. And it made me think that this is the wrong mentality. Um, we already have the foods that we need. We already have the territories of life that are in place. We need to be able to honor and in a sense, regenerate those uh, so that we can adequately feed all of the people um, uh, that need the food. It's all about distribution. We have more food than we know what to do with, uh, but it's often um, uh, in a sense, inaccessible to indigenous peoples and to other peoples based on politics, based on policies, and ultimately based on colonial thinking. Leanne Simpson says it well, uh, when we talk about resurgence, we must be concerned with the reattachment of our minds, bodies, and spirits to the network of relationships and ethical practices that generates grounded normativity. 
It's about understanding our our place in the universe. Um, it's about understanding our place in relationship and understanding ultimately that those relationships promote that responsibility. And so it's about um, it's about living our day to day lives um, with this notion of kinship and understanding that uh, what happens to the land also happens to our bodies. Trish Montour, the late Trish Montour is a Mohawk scholar, uh, talks about self-determination as being principally first and foremost about relationships. Communities cannot be self-governing unless members of those communities are well and living in a responsible way. This shows a close interrelationship between governance and relationality. We can't uh, really understand one without the other. And so in that sense, our peoplehood, our nationhood, if you will, is about those interlocking features of land, language, ceremonial life, um, and even our sacred living histories, and understanding the interconnections. If one falters, if one is challenged, then the others begin to also be challenged. And in that sense, um, we need to understand the deep, complex relationships that we as Indigenous peoples have with uh, not only the land and water, but with more than human relations. This is why I focused in my work on everyday acts of resurgence. Um, in a sense, this is my daughter uh, rescuing a uh, doxy or a box or a uh, snapping turtle uh, from the road. Um, and on the surface, this looks like a really mundane thing, but in a, in a larger sense, this is about relationships and uh, our Cherokee relationships to turtles, doxy, are quite profound. That is, we talk about turtles uh, carrying us through different worlds because they can go on both land and water. They're also uh, what the women wear in our ceremonies. Uh, they, they wear turtle shells and they keep the rhythm of our ceremonies. And so turtles uh, are just one part of our relationship, but the everyday actions that we engage in whether we're practicing our languages, whether we're um, uh, speaking to our children about, um, about relations, about their genealogy, all of those things are significant. They're not things that make the headlines, but they lead to, I think, micro actions that lead to, I think, revolutionary uh, behavior. Land back is another um, kind of movement that is way more than a hashtag. Uh, it embodies, in a sense, the politics of resurgence and, and ultimately the, the uh, protection of territories of life. It's about consent-based jurisdiction. It's about ultimately reasserting indigenous laws on indigenous lands. And there's a nice report on it uh, from the Yellowhead Institute, if you're interested as well as a special issue of Rooted, which is an international indigenous law journal. It's important to understand as well that as indigenous peoples, we have our own sense of what is international. and It goes far beyond state borders. And so this is one example from The Condor and the Eagle, which is a film I'd recommend. Uh, the signing of the Indigenous Women of the Americas Defender of Mother Earth Treaty Compact 2015 which basically connected Indigenous women uh, all across the Americas in order to make a commitment to protect and honor their territories of life, um, the things that nurture them and sustain them, their ecologies of intimacy, if you will. Another example is the Salween Peace Park in uh, basically war-torn uh, Burma or Myanmar. Uh, this was developed in 2018 by the Karen, uh, who had experienced so much violence at the hands of the state. Uh, they created this peace park with this idea that this, is, this would be a place where they could practice their, uh, um, their sustainable self-determination. That is, that this is where they would practice their traditional livelihoods. This is where they would honor those relationships to the land and water. And so uh, the Salween Peace Park has been bombed repeatedly by the, um, uh, by the military of the uh, Myanmar or Burma, a Burmese government. And so um, it's about how do you protect these 
relationships when they're under threat, when they're under duress. Another example I like to point out is the Buffalo Treaty of 2014, which is a treaty of cooperation, renewal, and restoration. It's about honoring that, um, that relationship to the Buffalo um, and the, restore, uh, the restoration of this relationship uh, to Blackfeet territory. And so it started off with, uh, I think it was 10 signatories in 2014, now has over 30. So uh, this is a treaty for and by Indigenous peoples. Tiny House Warriors or Shaquemek land defenders are fighting uh, the encroachment of the, um, uh, basically the, the oil pipelines onto their territories. Um, and you can see that they're talking about free prior and informed consent and no man camps. That is, uh, man camps or industrial camps are often established near um, uh, sites of, of oil extraction and leads to assaults on indigenous women, two-spirit and queer peoples. And so this is a stand against man camps, but it's also a stand against uh, encroachment onto their territory. So again, protecting territories of life. Indigenous food systems are so important or so vital to our health and well-being. And there's a sacred or divine aspect to it. This is Don Morrison, who uh, started the Indigenous Food Systems Network in our neck of the woods in, in British Columbia. Uh, it also involves self-determination and policy. The Helsinki and Haida Peace Treaty is all about protecting and honoring the relationship um, uh, to, uh, uh, to their food systems. And so uh, basically protect, they came together after uh, over a hundred years of, of conflict in order to protect and honor uh, the food systems of their, of their territories. Mauna Kea in Hawaii is another site of Hawaiian resurgence um, and it's a place where they're protecting uh, their territory, the sacred mountain, from encroachment by the 30 meter telescope. And so uh, that's a place I visited uh, uh, over a year and a half ago and had a profound impact uh, in terms of the ways in which they engaged in protecting these territories of life. And it was a spiritual aspect. It also had an international uh, aspect. And you see the Cherokee flag waving on the far right. Uh, but they also built their own university, uh, the Puhulu Hulu University, which was basically on the lava rocks. It was chairs seated around the lava rocks. This to me is the way in which we transmit um, our innovative ways that in which we transmit this knowledge these practices to future generations. It can be on the lava rocks, it can be anywhere. And um, it has such a profound impact on, on people's, um, uh, I guess, future learning. Another way that we've been doing this work in our neck of the woods in, on Songhees or Esquimalt uh, territory is regenerating Quetlal or Camas, which is a major food source. And so, um, Basically, it's under threat. 95% has been wiped out. This is what Camus looks like. And it's been um, uh, the work of Cheryl Bryce and the Lekwungen Community Toolshed, which were restoring uh, Camus or Quetlaw and by removing invasive species. So this is some of the invasives that we've removed. Also, community-led climate strategies in Inuit territory, where you create your own climate plan or another way to think about sustainability. And Red Tide, which is a climate action summit that took place in Aotearoa, uh, I participated in that one. And it becomes more than just a summit, it's a movement. It's a movement of indigenous peoples for the land and for these territories of life. And here you can see the Te Kaha Marae in, in 2018 and the participants. It's also about creating spaces for resurgence, spaces for solidarity, uh, resurgence spaces are structured not on, but for the principle of reciprocity. Uh, as according to Michael Elliott, they presuppose indigenous centricity and authority, and in doing so figure settlers as guests. If they were to remain welcome, settlers are under the requirement to adapt their behavior and meet the conditions of hospita hospitality that they have no say in determining. That is, take direction from indigenous peoples rather than proclaiming yourself to be an ally 
Uh, and so I challenge people to think about different ways that they can create space for resurgence. The old question, are you making space or taking space? And ultimately, at the end of the day, the land is ceremony. The land is life for us as Indigenous peoples. This is the ways in which we, uh, these are the ways in which we uh, transmit our knowledge to future generations. These are the ways that we practice sustainable self-determination. Uh, these are the uh, ecologies of intimacy that we protect so dearly because they are our future. And so I'll close there. Uh, what a